The normal rectangular traffic pattern is how many of us work on perfecting our landing techniques. Flying a full traffic pattern constitutes a good deal of flight techniques in a roughly six minute time period, from the takeoff and climb out, to turns and power management, to the descent, approach, and landing. Here we are on runway 33 at College Park, about to take off and fly a left-hand pattern back around to land. Let's look at the maneuver mapped out. We'll highlight the runway here towards the right of the image so it stands out. Our pattern will have us make left-hand turns so that we stay to the west and south of the field as we maneuver to come back around to land. It begins with the takeoff. We'll aim to keep ourselves moving straight with respect to the extended center line of the runway as we gain altitude. At around 500 feet above ground, we'll begin our first turn to the left. This is the crosswind leg of the pattern. We continue in the climb up to 1,000 feet where we'll level off. Our next turn puts us on the downwind leg. Here, we've maneuvered to be about three quarters of a mile away from the runway, close enough that we should be able to make it back in the event of a power loss. When we're abeam the numbers, meaning the beginning of the runway is just off our left shoulder, we'll begin a descent. We continue flying straight on this leg to lose altitude, and when the runway is roughly 45 degrees behind us, we'll make another left turn, now onto the base leg. We're getting progressively slower and setting up our landing configuration with flaps and gear if needed. We'll make our turn onto final to try to pick up the extended center line of the runway and prepare to go into our landing. Here's what it looks like from the cockpit. As we fly this, pay attention to how much we rely on sight picture references out the windows and how little we use our instruments. We want to stay on the extended center line of the runway. Obviously, we can't see the runway behind us, so we want to use visual references in front of us. So what we can do is draw with our mind's eye an imaginary center line extending out into the trees in front of us. Try to stay on that line and shoot to have the aircraft pass over the area and the trees the line cuts through. As we climb higher, we can extend our imaginary center line further out. First, passing just to the left of this apartment building, and then all the way out to these two buildings on the horizon. If these points are moving left or right in our line of sight, we should adjust as necessary with rudder. Remember that in a single engine airplane, we'll be using a good deal of right rudder here to stay on that center line. As long as the wings are level, we shouldn't need much or any aileron input. Around 500 AGL, we'll make our first turn. Before we do so, let's make sure it's clear by having a look left. Some pilots will lift a wing to make extra sure. Let's pick out a spot off our left wing. That mall with the high-rise building in the middle of it should work. We'll start a turn and roll out of it when that point is off our nose. This is how we know we've made a 90 degree turn. We could take a look left again to see that the runway is at a nice right angle to us now. We should be leveling off at a thousand feet here. Around this point, we'll take a look off our left shoulder again and pick another spot to aim for on our downwind turn. We'll use those low rise school buildings just to the right of the windy road. As we turn, we work to maintain a thousand feet by keeping a level pitch attitude and referencing our altimeter now and again, rolling out of the turn when pointed at the schools. We'll stay on the downwind for a bit here. It's our longest leg in the traffic pattern. Taking a look to our left, we should see ourselves moving parallel to the runway. In other words, it's not getting further away or closer to us, and we'll adjust our course if necessary. We can also judge our distance to the runway here as well. In the Cessna, we aim to have the runway cut through the wing strut about half to three quarters of the way up, equating to a distance of about three quarter miles at this altitude. Other planes will obviously use different sight pictures. When we're abeam the numbers for runway 33, we'll start our descent, bringing power back, bleeding off airspeed, and configuring as necessary. Again, this will look different depending on what you're flying, but we'll aim to be at a nice, easy descent attitude at a slower speed here. In fact, from here on out, we'll only need to reference the airspeed indicator, the tachometer, and our outside references. We'll take a look back at the runway. We should plan a base turn that will put us in position to descend to our runway aiming point without having to change power or pitch too much. This may be when the numbers are roughly 45 degrees behind us, but use your judgment. Again, we'll pick a point off our left shoulder, the larger school should work, and turn towards it. All the while, we should be referencing the runway. 
asking ourselves that if we didn't change pitcher power, would we be high or low? We should also reference our speed, looking to slow to our approach speed by the time we end up on final. We'll reference the extended center line of the runway and start our turn in such a way that we roll out with our butt directly underneath it on final. We'll aim to be fully configured with flaps and gear and on our desired airspeed here. We'll make adjustments with pitch and power so that our butts, our chairs, are moving towards the aiming point and we're maintaining our airspeed. From here, we bring power idle when needed and go into our round out and touchdown. This is the basic traffic pattern and you'll become very familiar with it as you practice landings. The main takeaway from this as we go into other topics in this course is that the pattern is very much a visual exercise. Use your sight picture outside to develop judgment about climbs, descents, and turns and rely to a much lesser extent on the instruments. Besides the airspeed indicator, altimeter, and tachometer, you shouldn't really reference the other instruments at all as they're a poor substitute for what's really going on outside in real time.